Welcome to The 100 Podcast. As Ed and Charlie here with you. Hope you're well. Today, we're really excited to be joined by Welsh fire batter Ian Cobain. Ian, how are you doing? Yeah, very well. Thank you, guys. And thanks very much for having me on. No, it's all in. It's a pleasure. It's our pleasure. First things first, I guess, Ian. How are you finding 100 so far? Yeah, it's brilliant. It's um, it, it's actually so exciting. Um, I think it's, it's obviously nice having the fans back in as well, which, you know, we haven't had for, for quite a while now. So, you know, getting back into the into the grounds and having having full stadiums has been has been awesome. Yeah, and obviously you've played in the Blast for a number of years. Now you've played in the hundred. Does the standard feel higher in this competition to you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's um, you know you, you look through the teams now, and you know there's there's no weak links in there. You know everyone's you know the the top lads have all played international cricket in franchises around the world and. You know, and then like the rest of the guys are, are excellent county cricketers as well. So there's no there's no real weak links in in any of the teams. So you know you you don't really get any sort of any time off if you like. It's you're under the pump whether with bat or ball for the whole game. And what do you make of the new format? And I guess the unique little quirks that come with it. I think last night's a really good example of how that kind of plays out with Quinton the cock. He just didn't face about. I think he faced five balls or so in the power play, which is so strange. And that's something that could really only happen in this new format. Is that something you've spoken about as a team, those kind of little nuances? Yes, yeah, like um, obviously with the, the less of change of ends, if you like, <clears throat> if you get so if you get stuck at one end, then you don't get to face many balls. And you know, it only really needs to it only really needs to take, you know, the, someone to get get a single off the tenth ball and and then you're down the other end for like another eight balls or whatever. It, it's um it works. It works well for the batters who are in. Obviously, they get into a bit of a bit of a rhythm and and get cracking. But if you're if you don't face many balls, you sort of yeah, you don't really find your rhythm if you like. So that's yeah, that's one thing that that we've had to get used to as as batters for for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously you guys started really, really well in this tournament. Then obviously lost Johnny Bairstow and Jake Ball, two really key players in your side. As a group, how do you kind of go about assessing areas you can improve and moving forward after a couple of losses? Yeah, it was obviously a big loss to, to lose to lose Johnny after those first two games and then for, for Jake to get injured, you know, in the next game after that, then, you know, it's, it's two big holes in our team. Um, just mainly for the balance of the side as well, you know, it's um, it's not just a replacing them with a batter or a bowler. It's the it's what they bring as a as a as a leadership group as well. You know, they obviously had a, a huge impact in the dressing room and with the lads. And to play with those guys has been has been amazing. And you know, just picking their brains on a daily basis has been has been awesome. Yeah, of course. They're going to say there's a lot of big talent and experience there and I guess no more so than your coach Gary Kirsten obviously a hugely renowned coach lots of experience lots of I guess credibility that comes with him what's he been like in the camp what's he been like to to play under he's been he's been amazing he's been he's been really good um you know he brings like you say a huge amount of experience and to to pick his brains about how how he goes about it and how he looks to set up set up a team and set up our tactics going into the games and the the level of of scouting that we do before before each match has been has been amazing. Mm, and we've heard rumors that obviously this is a new franchise, new team, new players, new coach that Gary wanted to kind of get you guys together and well, we've heard that he took you all on a hike to the Brecon Beacons. I would love <laughs> an insight into going on a hike with Gary Kirsten. No, that was yeah. It was on the it was on the schedule for those first couple of days um, leading into it, and then I, I don't know what happened. I don't know whether maybe some of the senior guys have had a word with them and gone gone. <laughs> probably not, it's probably not going to go down very well, given the fact that the lads have played a lot of cricket. You know, in as everyone as everyone knows, it's such a busy schedule. So yeah, we were we were hoping just to get a couple of days just to sort of down tools and, and get to know each other and and then yeah luckily it was uh luckily it was taken it was taken off the schedule i'm i've got to say i'm gutted about that because we've been speaking so much <laughs> just between ourselves about how hilarious this idea was of you guys just like hiking around the Brecon beak and potentially rolling your ankles getting injured in this most ridiculous setup but i'm already thinking you went to the millennium stadium as well and had a tour with like the Wales rugby team yeah that's right yeah it was that was so that was a great experience, actually. Um, I'm not a big rugby person, you know. Being from Liverpool, I was I'm all football, really. So, <clears throat> some of, some of the guys obviously enjoyed it a lot more than than I did, and and knew who the the big dog rugby players were, who were 
who were giving us the tour. So it was, um, but to, to get into the changing rooms and, and to walk on the field and just to sort of take in the surroundings was, was amazing. You can only really dream of it being, you know, packed, packed out at 70,000 full of all the, the rugby crazy Welsh fans cheering on, cheering on Wales, you know, it's, it does definitely, it gave me goosebumps anyways, and that's not even being a, a rugby fan. I guess, you know, there's a lot of players there who haven't really played together before, obviously, but like Johnny, Johnny Bairstow, Tom Banton, Jimmy Nish from Kays Armoured, obviously a lot of talent, but I'm sure you've learned a lot being around them. But until that point, I guess you've never really known each other that well. So I, was that a good bonding experience for you guys to, I guess, come together as a team and really, you know, come together? Yeah, it was it was it was great. You know, we we had a couple of team dinners early on, and you know, getting to know everybody about how they tick, how they tick as a human, and then you know, you go into training sessions and and watching how they prepare for games, and you know, the scouting that we do before games on oppositions and stuff like that. You know, pretty much everyone's played against each other at some point across across their careers, whether it be in England or overseas, and you know, the the level of the level of detail and knowledge that they bring into those meetings is, has been amazing. Yeah, it's been it's been great to learn from. Yeah, and obviously this experience of heading into a new squad must be a bit weird for you because obviously you came through the ranks at Lancashire, but now you've been at Gloucestershire for what, over a decade now, I think. Yeah. How was it kind of guess I guess going into a new dressing room? Because that must be such a new experience for you. Yeah, definitely. You know, when we we get together on the Monday morning or whatever, whatever day it was and you know, we're all sat in the team room and just watching people filter in going, well, oh, I've played against you for a number of years, but I've never really said hello. And then, you know, everyone sort of gets together and it was actually, it was actually all right. It was, everyone got over the awkwardness within, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and people, people were chatting along to each other, like, like they were all mates, which was, which was really nice, actually. You know, we, we didn't have any, we haven't got any egos in the team, you know, so everyone's getting on like an absolute house on fire. You know, we've had, we've had a lot of fun over the last four weeks or whatever it's been, three weeks, four weeks. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like a really nice team environment, which is obviously lovely. But I want to focus on your personal game just for a little bit here, Ian, and kind of rewind to 2019, which is where the original 100 draft happened. It doesn't really feel like that was real in hindsight. That was such a crazy time compared to now. But just talk me through that, kind of the history of that, because from what I understand, you weren't picked in the original draft. And I guess that kind of made you look at a few things and you went away the next year, completely revamped your game, came out of a lot more attacking intent and basically had one of your best ever seasons. And then you got picked up for the Welsh Fire. Could you, I guess, talk me through that process? Because it sounds like it must have been quite a tough period for you. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, given my stats over over the last however many years, you know, they, they've always been up there and, and, you know, I compare myself to some of the guys who get picked up in the franchises around the world and you go, do you know what, I'm, I'm either my stats are either just as good or, you know, are not far off. So, you know, I was, I was pretty confident going into the first draft in 2019 and then to not get picked up was, was, yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a bitter, bit of pill to swallow, really. It was, I was like, well, I got quite a lot of feedback about my strike, right? And I was like, well, I kind of get it, but you've got to look at the role that I do for Gloucester of the, you know, batting through and, and being the anchor of the innings. And I, I, I pride my my game on being being the not out batter, especially in a run chase. Whether that means sacrificing my strike rate to make sure that you know I don't get out and I don't put the team into a vulnerable position. But then I was thinking, well, you know, why can't I look after myself? And if I do well, then that's going to be more beneficial for the team also. So you know, I I, I had a, a conscious effort of of trying to up my strike rate, and you know. I managed to do that and, and yeah, probably had one of the best best years I've, I've had, to be honest. And, you know, it was no, no coincidence that we we done pretty well in the tournament as well. Yeah, and obviously at Gloucestershire, you have a really talented group. It does feel like sometimes you guys get looked over because, okay, there's yourself, Benny Howell, who is one of the best T20 bowlers in the world, doesn't get too many overseas gigs. David Payne, I think underappreciated. It feels like you guys have such a good squad and so many of you are just completely underappreciated. I mean, Tom Smith, I think last year in the blast, went at less than a run in the ball and he's not, I guess, he wasn't picked up for the 100. So it feels like you guys are a bit underappreciated. It definitely feels that way. You know, it's, it's, I think it's one of those things where if you play for a, a big county who, you know, hosts test matches every year, then, you know, the, the high profile or the higher profile that comes with that tends to be tends to be looked at more than 
than the actual what you're doing in the game you know so you know we we do speak about that a lot as as a group at Gloucester and say our, one of our biggest strengths is the fact that we all work for each other there's no egos in the team we're such a close knit unit and everyone knows their job inside out and you know we just say well if we just keep con- if we can keep doing that over a long period then we'd like to think that recognition will come along the line but you know we've been saying that now for for a number of years and you know i've i've luckily enough been picked up but you know someone like tom smith who hasn't been picked up then you know it's it's a bit of a that's still a bit of a struggle for him to then try and get the recognition you know it's i think this competition now if you get picked up and do well in the 100 i think that will only ultimately open up open up doors in other franchises going forward well, on that on that point, actually, about playing franchise T20 cricket globally, and and you say that obviously this is a great opportunity for guys, you know, across the league to kind of get those opportunities. Is that something you think about? Is that something you kind of uh, have an eye on? Maybe potentially kind of having a couple of good innings and maybe getting a gig somewhere overseas over the winter. Absolutely, you know that's that's definitely been my goal for a number of years now, especially. For me, with my age coming towards the back end of my career, if you like, if I can, you know, if I can dot around and go to a couple of the franchises over these next couple of years, you know, just set you up for life after cricket as well. You know, whether that be opportunities elsewhere or, or however you want to look at it, you know, and it, I think ultimately is 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 getting that recognition for for what I've done over the last probably eight seasons, I reckon. Yeah, and I feel like your, I guess your kind of recent move up the order might help you there as well. I mean, I know in the earlier stages of your career you're more of a middle order player, but you've been batting higher recently, and I noticed the other day you opened up as well. Is that something you're going to do more of? Maybe can take take more balls up to the, you know, score more runs early on. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I've batted at three for Gloucester for I don't know how many years now, probably six or eight years, and you know, I I, I love batting at three and. Especially with the with the hundred as well now being obviously a shorter format, then if I open it's I look at opening and batting at three is is basically the same job anyway. More often than not, you're in in the power play. Um, but yeah, opening the batting is definitely something that I want to do because obviously I want to face as many balls as I can possibly face, you know. And, and if that means opening or batting at three, then then so be it. But yeah, I, I do love batting up the order and especially batting in the power play. Mm. There's lots of experienced guys in that Welsh fire dressing room, like yourself, who obviously want to bat up the order. You know, Tom Banton, Johnny Bairstow, Ben Duckett as well. I guess it must be really nice to be in a dressing room where there are four or five of those players who are putting their hand up and trying to force their way up the order. But there's just so much talent there. Yeah, we like we that's what we noticed from from the first game is we've got we did have so much so much batting depth. You know, I think the first game I ended up coming in at seven or something like that, you know, because we had like Ben Ducky went in to face the spin and then we had like Glenn Phillips and Jimmy Nisham who are two like extremely powerful strikers of the ball. So, you know, they ended up going in in front of me as well. And then I came in at seven and I was like, well, it's obviously annoying for me to come in at seven. But if you look at it from a team aspect, you know, it's it's such a strong batting lineup and we batted, we batted so deep. And I think that's shown with our with our order this year, you know, I've, I've batted at seven, I've batted at six, I've batted at three, I've opened, you know, people have chopped and changed given the situation of the game, which, you know, if you look at, if you look at the majority of our batting performances this year, you know, we've, we've actually batted pretty well in the tournament. Hmm. And obviously you mentioned there a lot of experienced guys that I guess are very well known and kind of across the world, really. Tom Banton, Johnny Bairstow, Jimmy Neesham, Glenn Phillips, loads of big names there. But maybe a guy who I think I think is definitely recognised across the teaching circuit, but maybe is somebody that the fans of the 100 might be new to is Kays Ahmad. I believe he is Crick Viz's most valuable bowler so far. How much did you kind of know about him? I know he's he's played for Kent in the Blast recent, but how much did you know about him? And how much have you been impressed by him? Because he's been fantastic this tournament. Yeah, he's been he's been brilliant. You know, I've only the, the first time I've come across him was this year playing against Kent, um, and you know you could see how good he was for Kent, and then obviously him playing in the same team it was was pretty exciting leading into the tournament, and then getting to watch <clears throat> getting to watch how he trains and how he goes about about his cricket in in games as well has been has been awesome. You know, and he's been he's been so good for us this year. He has. And what about Jimmy Neesham? We all know of Jimmy Neesham. He's a big character. What's he been like to play with? Yeah, big character sums him up very well. 
Um, I was a bit unsure about what I was going to get from Jimmy when we first entered into the tournament. And then I think it was one of the first days or two that me and him played golf, you know, and I got to know him pretty well playing golf. And we've actually, we've actually hit it off really well. And, you know, we've got these, these next three days off. Um, he's actually come to stay with me in Bristol. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, yeah, we, we get on, we get on pretty well and, you know, it's, it's nice having him around the changing room. He's got a lot of, a lot of things to say and, you know, he's been around the world and, and, played international cricket for, for years so he brings so much knowledge and experience into the team it's it's brilliant for the lads to learn from thank you so much for joining us Ian it's been a pleasure but lastly what's one thing about the 100 that has really stood out to you having played a few games now it's just the, the buzz around the game itself obviously it's a new format and people weren't exactly sure what they were going to get from it you know I think it caught quite a lot of criticism before the tournament started but the fact that so many people have, have come out to watch it and it's been shown on terrestrial TV as well, which has helped hugely. It's just created such a buzz around the game, which, you know, might or might not have been fizzling out. Um, I think it's been, it's been awesome. And I think it's only, it's only been good for the game. Like it's, it can only, it can only help moving forward. And I think, I, I think it will be here to stay and it'll be interesting to see if any other countries um, adopt adopt the format as well. Perfect. Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you and best of luck for the rest of the tournament. No, awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, guys. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Podcast 100. We've got loads of clips there, loads of different stuff going on. So make sure to follow us there. And please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. We'd love to know what you think and uh, it would really help us out. So thank you very much for listening to the 100 podcast and we'll speak to you next time. Thank you.